And now coming to our stage is Chris Howard. So September 10th didn't exactly start off the way it should for an 18 year old who just spent his whole night out and got home at 4 a.m. My father came and he kicked the door open at 7 a.m. and said, let's go, get out of bed. We're going to fix your car today because as typical hotshot 18 year old, I wrecked my car. So we piled into the car and got over to the junkyard. I had a little 85 Honda Accord, so we had to buy a new hood, we had to buy a new radiator, and we went back to the house and put it together. So uh, I had to go back to work that night. I was a manager of a restaurant. So it was around 3.30 and I looked at my dad and we were just finishing up and I was gonna be able to drive my car to work. And I said, uh, there's some factories across the street and the roach coach pulled up. So I said to him, uh, do you want lunch? And he kind of looked at me with his smirk like, you gonna buy me lunch? All right, buy me lunch. So I walked across the street. I got him a meatball Parmesan hero. I brought it back and I handed it to him and I uh, went to work for the night. So uh, got home late that night, it was like two o'clock. He was watching a movie with his girlfriend. Just kind of said goodnight and uh, went to bed late. And uh, when I woke up the next morning, it was uh, already 11.30 in the morning and everything kind of already happened. And uh, I didn't turn the TV on. I, uh, I got on the computer and my friend IM'd me. Back then we had AOL as the messenger, I think of the past. And, uh, his, text, his message to me was, I hate terrorists. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, where have you been all day? Turn on your TV. So I turn on the TV, and now I kind of see everything that's going on. And it hasn't really hit me yet. It was my dad's day off, so he's supposed to be home. So I say, hey, Dad, Dad, where are you? And uh, there's no answer. So I go upstairs, and I look at the message machine, and there's 45 messages, and I hit play. And every message is, George, where are you? George, give me a call. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? So I go, he's busy. So I beep him, I still remember it. It's 888-525-1115. Mm -hmm. Text beep him 911 and I get my car and I go to my grandma's house. And I get at grandma's house and I knock on the door. It's around 1, 1 1.30 and I say, uh, I walk in just to check on her and she says, no one can find your dad. We don't know where he is. And I just laugh at her and I say, come on, you know, daddy's busy. He's uh, taking care of business and he'll call us when he can. So I get back in the car and I, pick up a friend and we head over to Nassau University Medical Center to give some blood. And we get turned away at the door. They said they had too much. So I go, I drop my friend off and swing by the house to let my dog out. And I'm about three blocks from my grandmother's house and I'm sitting at a light and it's about 3.30 in the afternoon. And um, they say Tower 7 just collapsed. And it just comes, this wave just comes over me and I start crying in the car and in my head I'm saying that if he's not gone, yet he's gone now. And I just, I don't know why I felt like that, and I could never put my finger on it. And uh, I drove the six more blocks to my grandmother's house and I pulled into the driveway and parked the car and my uncle walks over to me and has put the window down. I put the window down and he says, uh, turn your car off, I gotta talk to you. And I immediately knew right then and there and all six foot five of me started punching the dashboard and believe it or not, I kicked the windshield from inside the car. And uh, the next couple days were a blur. And then, uh, you know, I ended up finding out that they had found him at 3.30. And that always struck me as really odd is how it just came over me. And, you know, I was one of the lucky ones. We had something to bury. And uh, it's the only thing I could keep thinking about. And um, on September 14th, we went down to uh, to Jacob Javits Center and we met President Bush and we gave him my dad's badge. And uh, we got home from that and that was all like a big great thing and there was all this flurry of things going on and we weren't really thinking about what was really going on. And uh, my birthday is actually September 17th and uh, our wake started the next day and I buried my dad on my 19th birthday. So to me, I just, I was lost. I lived with my dad for seven years now and I didn't know what to do anymore. So, uh, you know, it was like, where's that 19 year old kid who really needs his dad to do now? And the next few months again were blurry. On September 20th, uh, George Bush held up my dad's badge and said, this is my reminder of lives that ended and a test that does not end. And I could never stop thinking about that. And then I kept always thinking about when I was 15 years old in my dad's car on a road trip and he turned to me at 11.30 at night one night and said to me, uh, you know, there's gonna come a day when I might not come home from work 
and you're gonna have to take care of your brother. So I started taking care of my brother, and I got myself in school, and here I am today. And, and uh, the thing that probably hurts the most for me is, uh, it's two things actually, is that uh, I wasn't that snot-nosed 19 year old anymore. I became a New York City firefighter, mm -hmm. and he wasn't there to see me graduate. Instead, I had his two best friends, Ray Seeley and his partner. And um, it still meant the world to me to have him there, but I still wish my dad was there. And the other thing that hurts the most is I'm getting married in six weeks. It's not gonna be there. But I still carry his memory on every day, and tomorrow, for the fifth year in a row, I'm gonna push off with these two guys right here and ride a bicycle 300 miles for four days. Yeah.